Chapter Number One of the Tale of Grumpy Weasel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey, A Slim Rascal. Old Mr. Crow often remarked that if Grumpy Weasel really wanted to be of some use in the world, he would spend his time at the sawmill filling knot holes in boards. He's so slender, Mr. Crow would say, that he can push himself into a knot hole no bigger round than Farmer Green's thumb. Naturally, it did not please old Mr. Crow when Solomon Owl went out of his way one day to tell him that he was sadly mistaken. For after hearing some gossip repeat Mr. Crow's opinion, Solomon Owl, the wise old bird, had given several long hoots and hurried off, though it was broad daylight, to set Mr. Crow right. The trouble, Solomon explained when he had found Mr. Crow on the edge of the woods, the trouble with your plan to have Grumpy Weasel work in the sawmill is that he wouldn't keep a knot hole filled longer than a jiffy. It's true that he can fit a very small hole, but if you ever watched him closely, you'd know that he's in a hole and out the other side so fast you can scarcely see what happens. He's entirely too active to fill the bill. Old Mr. Crow made a queer noise in his throat, which showed that Solomon Owl had made him angry. I never said anything about Grumpy Weasel's filling any bills, Mr. Crow spluttered. Not holes were what I had in mind. I've no doubt, though, that you'd like Grumpy Weasel to fill your own bill. Now, if Solomon Owl had not tried more than once to catch Grumpy Weasel, perhaps Mr. Crow's retort wouldn't have made him feel so uncomfortable. And muttering that he wished when people spoke of his beak, they wouldn't call it a bill, and that Mr. Crow was too stupid to talk to, Solomon blundered away into the woods. It was true, of course, that Grumpy Weasel was about the quickest of all the furred folk in Pleasant Valley. Why, you might be looking at him as he stopped for a moment on a stone wall, and while you looked he would vanish before your eyes. It was just as if he had melted away in an instant. So quickly could he dart into a crevice between the stones. It was surprising, too, that he could whisk himself out of sight so fast, for his body was absurdly long. But if he was long in one way, he was short in another. Yes, Grumpy Weasel had the shortest temper of all the field and forest folk throughout Pleasant Valley. Even peppery Peter Mink was not so short-tempered as he. So terrible-tempered was Grumpy Weasel that whenever the news flashed through the woods that he was out hunting, all the small people kept quiet still because they were afraid. And even some of the bigger ones, a good deal bigger than Grumpy Weasel himself, felt uneasy. So you can see whether or not Grumpy Weasel was welcome. End of chapter 1、Chapter、two of the Tale of Grumpy Weasel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. The Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey. At the Old Stone Wall. Little Mr. Chippy suddenly set up a great twitter. Anybody could see that he was frightened. 
and one of jolly robin's sons perched in an apple tree near the stone wall where mr chippy lived in a wild grapevine wondered what could be the matter presently as he looked beneath him he saw a long slim shape dart from a chink of the old wall and as quickly disappear ha huh, said young master robin foolish people who build their homes on walls must expect snakes for visitors and feeling quite wise and grown up he turned his back on mr chippy as if it really made no difference to him if mr chippy did have a dangerous caller meanwhile others of the bird neighbors began to echo mr chippy's warning notes and young master robin thought everybody was silly to make such a fuss over the misfortunes of a humble person like mr chippy if they don't look out they'll scare all the angleworms back into their holes he grumbled a remark which shows that he knew little about the ways of the world and when rusty wren swerved near him and called to him to look out for mr chippy's visitor that he was a bad one young master robin actually puffed himself up with rage he seems to think i'm in danger of falling out of this tree he sneered aloud he doesn't know that i can handle myself in a tree as well as he can as he spoke master robin all but tumbled off his perch but he caught himself just in time then looked around hastily to see if anybody had noticed his awkwardness all this time poor mr chippy's cries continued there was really no reason for his alarm for his wife was away from home with all their children but mr chippy kept flying back and forth in a great flutter he too called to young master robin that he'd better go home still that knowing youngster paid no heed to his elder's advice if snakes climb trees i've never seen them do it he scoffed hi there haven't you seen mr chippy started to say but before he could finish his question master robin interrupted him rudely certainly i saw him he cried i saw him come out of the wall and go in again he'll get you if you don't go away mr chippy shrieked let him try master robin scoffed he was sorry that mr chippy did not hear him but that distracted little person had already hurried off to warn somebody else it was no time at all before rusty wren's wife gave a piercing scream that fat robin boy he'll be caught she wailed now it made master robin very angry to be spoken of in such a way as that fat he burst out in a loud tone as he stared in mrs wren's direction who's fat you are said a strange grumpy voice right behind him or so it seemed to young master robin end of chapter two recording by phone chapter three of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phone the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey master robin's lesson when young master robin heard the strange voice that sounded so grumpy and so near him he was terribly frightened he forgot that he thought himself grown up and very wise and quite able to go about alone he didn't even look to see who was speaking but fell backwards off the limb of the apple tree it was lucky for him too that he fell just when he did for a long brownish person white and neat took master robin's place on the limb so promptly that you could hardly have said he jumped into it from somewhere else he seemed to have popped out of the tree somewhat as a freshly popped kernel of corn bursts forth a moment ago it was not there you were watching but did not see it grow big well all at once there was silence in the orchard everybody was holding his breath waiting to see what happened to young master robin though he had lost his balance and tumbled backward he righted himself quite like an old-timer and flew off across the orchard i didn't know snakes could climb trees he stammered to mr chippy who had followed him snakes mr chippy piped that wasn't a snake that was grumpy weasel and it's a wonder you ever escaped he added i must learn that backward somersault it's a good thing to know you can see that mr chippy was a very humble person but mr jolly robin's eldest son was quite proud already he had begun to feel that he had been very skilful in escaping but of course it was only an accident that he got away for once in his life grumpy weasel had been careless it had looked so easy catching that clumsy young robin 
he had spoken to master robin not dreaming that he could save himself to make matters worse grumpy had found mr chippy's nest empty and grumpy weasel was the sort of person that liked to find a bird at home when he called it always made him more ill-natured than usual to make a call for nothing and now he had let a stupid young robin escape him so it is not surprising that his big black eyes snapped nor that he said something in a fierce voice that sounded like chip 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 but meant something a good deal worse and to add to grumpy weasel's rage somebody had laughed hoarsely somebody had sat in a tall elm across the road if he could have caught mr crow there is no doubt that grumpy would have made that black scamp sorry that he laughed but old mr crow was too wary to let anybody surprise him ha ha he laughed again and grumpy weasel actually couldn't bear to hear him some of the onlookers claimed afterward that they saw grumpy weasel start down the tree and that was as much as they could say no one knew how he managed to slip out of sight and the field people say that he was never seen again in that exact spot end of chapter three chapter four of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phone the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey hunting a hole usually grumpy weasel did not stray far from a certain corner of farmer green's woodlot he preferred to hunt where he knew the lay of the land and since he liked especially to hunt along old stone walls he picked out a long stretch of old tumble-down wall that reached through the woods toward blue mountain he picked it out as his very own hunting ground and never asked permission of farmer green either now near the lower end of this wall the end towards the pasture a fat person known as mr meadow mouse sometimes wandered but he never visited that spot without first inquiring whether grumpy weasel had been there the day before mr meadow mouse had learned somehow that grumpy usually moved on each day to a different part of his hunting ground he was surprised therefore to meet grumpy weasel face to face one time when he felt sure that that surly rogue must be a good safe distance away mr meadow mouse cast a quick glance around but he could see no place to hide so there was nothing for him to do but to put on a bold front he bowed pleasantly enough though he was trembling a little and remarked that it was a fine day and that he hoped grumpy was feeling happy all of which was quite true grumpy weasel glowered at mr meadow mouse for that was his way of replying to a kindly greeting you've not come here to hunt i hope he growled i'll have you know that this is my private hunting ground and i allow no poaching mr meadow mouse hastened to explain that he was merely out for a stroll i never hunt he declared of course if i happen to see a tiny seed i may stop to eat it but that's all you'd better be careful what you say grumpy weasel snapped unless i'm mistaken you were hunting something the moment you saw me you were hunting a hole mr meadow mouse gasped slightly he hardly knew what to say be very careful where you go around here grumpy weasel warned him the holes in this stone wall are all mine i shouldn't want you to use a single one of them without my permission mr meadow mouse assured him that he wouldn't dream of trespassing and these holes among the roots of the trees they are mine too grumpy weasel snarled oh certainly certainly mr meadow mouse cried he was so quick to agree that for once grumpy weasel couldn't think of anything more to find fault about i'll let you crawl into a few of the smaller holes in the stone wall if you'll be careful not to hurt them he offered grudgingly mr meadow mouse made haste to thank him he said however that he thought he would wait till some other time there's no time like the present grumpy weasel grumbled to tell the truth i want to see if you can squeeze through as small a hole as i can end of chapter four chapter five of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phone the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey solomon owl interrupts plump little mr meadow mouse wished he had stayed away from grumpy weasel's hunting ground 
he would have scampered off had he not known that grumpy could overtake him before he had made three leaps so he saw no way out of his trouble though he could think of nothing less agreeable than trying to slip through a small hole with grumpy weasel close at hand watching him narrowly then all at once mr meadow mouse had an idea you go first he said politely go through any hole you choose and then i'll try my luck but grumpy weasel was too crafty for that you try your luck at running away he snarled you are the one to go first and we'll have no words about it well mr meadow mouse began to shake more than ever don't you think he quavered that we'd better wait a few days until i'm a bit smaller i'm afraid i've been overeating lately and i might get stuck in the hole and of course that would be awkward ha <laughs> ha grumpy weasel actually laughed but it was not what any one could call a hearty wholesome cheerful sort of laugh on the contrary it sounded very cruel and gloating hoo <laughs> another laugh this one weird and hollow boomed out from the hemlock tree just above mr meadow mouse's head he jumped in spite of himself did mr meadow mouse and so too did grumpy weasel both of them leaped for the old stone wall and each flashed into a crevice between the stones though grumpy weasel was ever so much the quicker of the two they knew solomon owl's voice too well to mistake his odd laughter what's your hurry gentlemen solomon called to them mild mr meadow mouse made no reply but from grumpy weasel's hiding place an angry hiss told solomon owl that one of them at least had heard his question come out said solomon owl don't be shy i've dined already well that made the two in the wall feel somewhat bolder and soon they ventured to peep out and gaze at solomon to see whether he looked like a person who had just enjoyed a good meal you're not as hollow as you sound i hope grumpy weasel remarked with some suspicion in his tone as for mr meadow mouse he wouldn't dream of making so rude a remark it's a fine evening and i hope you're feeling happy he piped oh very very said solomon owl solemnly mr meadow mouse was a trusting sort of chap he was all ready to leave his cranny but grumpy weasel was not yet satisfied which one of us are you answering he demanded of solomon him said solomon did you say ahem grumpy weasel wanted to know no no solomon assured him i said him i was answering your friend grumpy weasel made a wry face as if he did not care to have anybody speak of mr meadow mouse as a friend of his and he did not quit the stone wall until he had seen mr meadow mouse venture forth in safety just by accident i overheard your remarks a few minutes ago mr owl explained i'd like to watch this hole crawling contest and i'll stay here and be the umpire and see that there's fair play end of chapter five chapter six of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by phone the Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey Mr. Meadow Mouse Escapes Grumpy Weasel did not like Solomon Owl's offer to be umpire of the whole crawling contest between Mr. Meadow Mouse and himself. He hissed a few times and glared at Solomon Owl up in the hemlock tree. Solomon Owl did not appear to mind that, but calmly outstared Grumpy Weasel without once blinking. Are you both ready? he asked presently yes thank you mr meadow mouse answered and grumpy weasel gave a sort of shrug as if to say that he supposed he was first you may try that hole between those mossy stones mr owl announced with a tilt of his head toward the wall certainly cried mr meadow mouse you go first and i'll follow grumpy weasel told him and mr meadow mouse didn't dare disobey he whisked through the hole spryly and was back again in no time then grumpy took his turn he was certainly quicker than mr meadow mouse even the umpire solomon owl had to admit that but of course that's not the point solomon observed it's the one that gets stuck in the hole that loses the contest well after grumpy and mr meadow mouse had slipped through several holes each one smaller than the one before mr meadow mouse said that he thought it was only polite to let grumpy go first 
secretly mr meadow mouse was afraid of what might happen if he should have the misfortune to get wedged in a hole with grumpy weasel ready to follow him he had had some trouble getting through the last one and he knew that he could never squeeze through one that was much smaller grumpy weasel lost his temper at once i'll do as i please on my stone wall he snapped and he was angrier than ever when solomon owl said to him it's your turn probably no other of the woods people unless it was one of the hawk family could have made grumpy weasel obey and now he insisted that if he went first he ought to be allowed to choose whatever hole he pleased both solomon owl and mr meadow mouse agreed so grumpy weasel popped through a hole of his own choosing and he did not reappear though he called to mr meadow mouse to come on mr meadow mouse hung back you'll have to excuse me he stammered what's the matter boomed solomon owl do you want to lose the contest no said mr meadow mouse but grumpy weasel is still inside that hole there's no other way out how do you know solomon owl asked him oh i've been here before often mr meadow mouse replied are you sure mr owl inquired i'll go on the other side of the wall and look mr meadow mouse offered and thereupon he skipped over the wall solomon owl waited patiently and so did grumpy weasel but mr meadow mouse never came back once out of sight he scampered away and he never trespassed on grumpy weasel's hunting ground again End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Tale of Grumpy Weasel. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey. Chapter Seven Patty Muskrat's Blunder. Sometimes Grumpy Weasel found the hunting poor along the stretch of stone wall that he called his own, though of course it really belonged to Farmer Green. And though he disliked to wander much in strange neighborhoods, once in a while he visited other parts of Pleasant Valley. It was on such an occasion to the bank of the mill pond that he caught sight one day of Paddy Muskrat, or to be more exact, that Paddy Muskrat caught sight of him. Now it was seldom that anybody spoke to Grumpy Weasel. On the contrary, most of the forest folk dodged out of sight whenever they saw him and said nothing. So he wheeled like a flash and started to run when somebody called, Hello, stranger! One quick backward glance at a small wet head in the water told Grumpy that he had nothing to fear hello yourself he retorted and you'd better not call me stranger because i'm no stranger than you are well penny muskrat for it was he who had spied grumpy weasel on the bank of the pond saw at once that whoever the slender and elegant person might be he had the worst of manners though patty had lived in the mill pond a long time he had never met any one that looked exactly like the newcomer to be sure there was peter mink who was long-bodied and short-tempered as the stranger appeared to be but when patty inquired whether the visitor wasn't a distant connection of the mink family as indeed he was grumpy weasel said what do you mean to insult me by asking whether i'm related to such a ragged ruffianly crowd somehow patty muskrat rather like that answer for peter mink and all his family were fine swimmers and most unwelcome in the mill pond and perhaps who knew perhaps the spick and span chap on the bank with the sleek coat and black tipped tail was one of the kind that didn't like to get his feet wet then patty muskrat asked the stranger a silly question he was not the wisest person anyhow in pleasant valley as his wife often reminded him you're not a distant relation of tommy fox are you he inquired grumpy weasel actually almost smiled now how did you happen to guess that he asked 
because you've got such a sharp nose patty muskrat replied and he was quite pleased with himself for he thought that he wasn't so stupid as some people thought any other reason grumpy weasel inquired stepping to the edge of the overhanging bank you don't like to get your feet wet patty muskrat said and feeling safe as anything he swam nearer the spot where the stranger was crouching patty saw almost too late that he had made a bad blunder for without the slightest warning grumpy weasel leaped at him and had not patty been a wonderful swimmer and able to dive like a flash he would never have dashed panting into his house a few moments later what on earth is the matter his wife asked him i've been having a swimming race with a stranger patty exclaimed i don't know his name but i do know that he'd just as soon get his feet wet as i would well why not mrs muskrat inquired that only shows he's sensible does it show i'm sensible too patty asked her certainly not said mrs muskrat end of chapter seven recording by john brandon chapter eight of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by john brandon the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey chapter eight the dare if grumpy weasel had been a faster runner the forest people wouldn't have been so surprised when he dared jimmy rabbit to race him everybody knew that jimmy was swift-footed especially since he once beat old mr turtle but that is another story when mr crow who was a great bearer of news told jimmy rabbit one day that grumpy weasel wanted to race with him jimmy rabbit seemed more than willing to oblige where when and how far does grumpy want to run against me he asked mr crow said that he didn't know but that he would make it his business to find out so off he hurried to find grumpy weasel for if there was anything mr crow liked it was busying himself with other people's affairs he did not have what you could call a pleasant talk with grumpy weasel once when mr crow alighted too near the ground grumpy jumped at him and several times he called mr crow a nest robber and an egg thief though goodness knows grumpy weasel himself was as bad as the worst when it came to robbing birds nests although he felt as if he were about to burst with rage old mr crow pretended to laugh he had been having a rather dull time waiting for farmer green to plant his corn and he thought that a lively race might put him in better spirits where do you want to race against jimmy rabbit mr crow asked we'll start from this wall said grumpy sulkily because it's always better to start from where you are than where you aren't mr crow said that seemed reasonable when do you want to race he added the sooner we start the quicker we'll finish grumpy weasel snapped quite true quite true mr crow agreed and now may i inquire how long a race you want to run no longer than i have to grumpy growled not more than a day or two i hope mr crow snickered slightly i see you don't understand my question he observed are you going to run a mile or only a few rods how do i know grumpy cried as if he had no patience with his questioner how could anybody tell i'll let jimmy rabbit start twenty jumps ahead of me and we'll run till i catch him well mr crow laughed right out loud when he heard that and he was about to tell grumpy that he would have to run till the end of his days if he raced jimmy rabbit in any such fashion as that but he saw all at once that such a race would be a great joke and he said to himself with a chuckle that the laugh would be on grumpy weasel for jimmy rabbit was so swift a runner that nobody who knew anything at all would ever consent to give him a start much less propose such a thing 
very well said mr crow with a smirk i'll report to jimmy rabbit i'll tell him where when and how you want a race and there's no doubt that your plan will please him i hope it won't grumpy weasel snarled i've never pleased anybody yet and i don't mean to and that goes to show what an ill-natured scamp he was end of chapter nine recording by john brandon chapter nine of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by john brandon the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey chapter nine saving his feet old mr crow and jimmy rabbit had a good laugh over grumpy weasel's plan for a race with jimmy they thought it a great joke he needn't give me a start jimmy said i can beat grumpy easily never mind that mr crow advised you might as well let him have his way he'll look all the more foolish trying to catch up with you so jimmy rabbit agreed to run the race as grumpy weasel wished saying that he was ready to start at once but mr crow told him he had better wait till the next day that will give me time to tell everybody he explained and then there'll be a big turnout to see you win and to jeer at grumpy weasel for losing and one could tell from mr crow's remark that he liked jimmy rabbit and that he despised grumpy weasel the next day proved to be a fine one for the race it wasn't too hot nor too cold and early in the morning the field and forest people began gathering at grumpy weasel's hunting ground where the stone wall touched the clearing about the only persons that objected to the time set for the race were benjamin bat and solomon owl benjamin said that he could never keep awake to watch it and solomon complained that he couldn't see well in the daytime but all the rest of the company were in the best of spirits giggling slyly whenever they looked at grumpy weasel who seemed to pay scant attention to his neighbors though you may be sure his roving black eyes took in everything that was going on he seemed more restless than ever as he waited for jimmy rabbit to arrive walking to and fro on his front legs in a most peculiar fashion while he kept his hind feet firmly planted on the ground in one spot of course he could never have moved about in this manner had his body not been so long and slender noticing grumpy's strange actions old mr crow looked worried and asked him what was the matter i hope your hind feet aren't troubling you just as the race is about to begin he said grumpy weasel hissed at the old gentleman before he replied don't worry you'll soon see that my hind feet can travel as fast as my front ones when i want to use them ah mr crow exclaimed knowingly he's saving his hind feet for the race when jimmy rabbit reached the gathering place coming up in a long lope mr crow hurried to meet him i advise you to save your hind feet he whispered grumpy weasel is saving his jimmy rabbit told mr crow with a smile that he had saved his hind feet all his life and his front ones too i have brought them along today," he said to help me win the race end of chapter nine recording by john brandon chapter ten of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey. Chapter 10. Ha and Ha Ha. A great outcry rang through the woods the moment Jimmy Rabbit set out to race Grumpy Weasel and beat him. Shouts of good luck and run hard and hurrah for james rabbit followed jimmy but old mr crow squawked 
you don't need to hurry he thought that the race was already as good as won for grumpy weasel had insisted on giving jimmy rabbit a start of twenty jumps meanwhile grumpy weasel glowered but he could not glower at jimmy's friends because he had to watch jimmy himself in order to count the first twenty jumps he took when grumpy had counted nineteen and a half away he started and old mr crow as he sat staring at the race declared that grumpy weasel hadn't a chance to win the company seemed ready to take mr crow's word for it that is all except grumpy weasel's cousin peter mink he spoke up and said that as for him he would wait and see what happened he didn't believe old mr crow knew what he was talking about mr crow grew almost purplish black with rage we'll all wait he said stiffly we'll all wait and when the race is over you will apologize to me peter mink merely grinned he had no respect for his elders and now he didn't appear to mind in the least when the entire company let him severely alone mr crow shot a triumphant look at him about an hour later when jimmy rabbit came bounding into sight with no one following him you may as well stop now mr crow told jimmy you've as good as won the race already jimmy rabbit said that he thought so too but he supposed he'd better keep running a while longer till grumpy weasel gave up so off he hopped again everybody except peter mink laughed heartily when grumpy weasel came springing up the slope a little while later you may as well stop now you've as good as lost already mr crow greeted him whose race is this yours or mine grumpy weasel hissed and off he hurried without pausing to hear mr crow's answer we'll wait a while longer mr crow told the company for the end is so near we may as well see it whose end peter mink asked him i mean the end of the race of course mr crow squalled oh i thought you meant the end of jimmy rabbit peter mink replied impossible impossible was all mr crow said to that he began to fidget which was a sign that he was worried and when jimmy rabbit appeared again mr crow was not quite so cocksure when he asked if the race wasn't over it would be jimmy rabbit answered but the trouble is grumpy weasel won't stop running ha said mr crow hoarsely but peter mink said ha ha and there is a great difference between those two remarks as we shall see end of chapter ten recording by john brandon chapter eleven of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey chapter eleven a long race the famous race between grumpy weasel and jimmy rabbit went on and on jimmy turned and twisted this way and that up and down and back and forth through pleasant valley he could still run faster than grumpy weasel it is true but he was growing tired now and then jimmy stopped to rest and he kept hoping that grumpy weasel had become so weary that he had given up the chase but grumpy weasel never stopped once and whenever jimmy rabbit spied him coming along his trail jimmy would spring up with a sigh and rush off again he began to understand that such a race was no joke he certainly didn't want to lose the race and he certainly didn't want grumpy weasel to come up with him he had always kept at a good safe distance from that ill-natured fellow and jimmy felt most uneasy now at the thought of grumpy's catching him he must be very hungry after running so far jimmy rabbit said to himself anxiously if he's as hungry as i am he wouldn't be a pleasant person to meet and that thought made jimmy run the faster for a time 
but he soon found that he had to stop more often to rest and to his great alarm grumpy weasel kept drawing nearer all the time at last jimmy rabbit became so worried that he swept around by the stone wall again and stopped to whisper to old mr crow he's still chasing me and i can't run forever what shall i do jimmy asked the old gentleman i'll think the matter over and let you know tomorrow mr crow muttered hoarsely to tell the truth he was alarmed himself and he had no idea what jimmy rabbit could do to save himself from grumpy weasel while they talked grumpy's cousin peter mink watched them slyly who do you think is going to win the race he jeered mr crow did not even turn his head he felt very uncomfortable but he tried to look unconcerned run along he said to jimmy tomorrow i'll tell you what to do tomorrow jimmy rabbit panted tomorrow will be too late then all at once mr crow had an idea and he whispered something in one of jimmy rabbit's long ears that made the poor fellow take heart all right jimmy cried i'll see you again sometime and away he ran just as grumpy weasel came racing along the stone wall looking as fresh as a daisy you'd better stop and rest a while mr crow croaked if you get too tired you'll never win rest grumpy exploded i don't need to rest i never felt better in my life except that i'm pretty hungry but i'm bound to win this race as he spoke of feeling hungry he cast a longing glance at jimmy rabbit who was just dodging out of sight behind a distant tree wait here a bit anyway mr crow urged him since you're sure to win as you say there can be no hurry and peter mink too begged his cousin grumpy to stop just a minute and he laughed ha ha whenever he looked at mr crow and strange to say mr crow said ha ha too end of chapter eleven recording by john brandon chapter twelve of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by sterling bronwyn the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey winning by a trick grumpy weasel wouldn't stop long with his cousin peter mink and old mr crow and all the rest he was in a hurry to overtake jimmy rabbit and after quarrelling fiercely with the whole company except his cousin he sprang up with a wicked glitter in his black eyes and left without another word that fixed him said mr crow knowingly what did peter mink demanded that rest mr crow replied it gave jimmy rabbit just enough time to go where he's going and that was all he would say not until grumpy weasel returned some time later did anyone know what mr crow meant grumpy weasel was in a terrible temper when he came slowly back everybody could tell without asking that the race was ended where did you catch him peter mink asked his cousin grumpy weasel said in a few ill-chosen words that he hadn't caught jimmy rabbit at all and that somebody had played a trick on him he looked directly at mr crow as he spoke it wasn't johnny green was it mr crow inquired solemnly as he moved carefully to a higher limb grumpy weasel could tell then without a doubt that it was mr crow that had made him lose the race grumpy had followed hot on jimmy rabbit's tracks and to his surprise they led straight toward the farm buildings but grumpy kept on and never stopped until he reached the farmyard fence where he crouched and watched Jimmy disappear, of all places, right in the woodshed where Johnny Green was picking up an armful of wood. Of course, Grumpy Weasel wouldn't think of entering such a dangerous place. And when he heard a shout and saw Johnny Green come out with Jimmy Rabbit in his arms, he knew that Jimmy Rabbit had won the race. 
even if he had lost his freedom. It was that old black rascal, Mr. Crow, that put that notion into Jimmy Rabbit's head, Grumpy said savagely to himself as he turned and made for the woods. They were talking together a little while ago. And all the way back to the stone wall, he kept thinking what he would do to Mr. Crow if he could ever get hold of him. So you can see that he must have looked very dangerous when he reached his hunting ground. And you can understand why Mr. Crow took pains to change his seat. I may have lost the race through a trick, Grumpy hissed as he glared at Mr. Crow. But one thing is certain, that young Jimmy Rabbit will trouble us no more. He is Johnny Green's prisoner. Nonsense, cried Mr. Crow. He'll escape some fine day. Nonsense. He won't, Grumpy Weasel disputed. And he never begged Mr. Crow's pardon. And neither did Peter Mink apologize to the old gentleman, as Mr. Crow had said he would. So in one way, Mr. Crow was wrong. But in another way, he was right. For it wasn't a week before Jimmy Rabbit appeared in the woods again as spry as ever. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of The Tale of Grumpy Weasel This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sterling Bronwyn The Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey Silly Mrs. Hen Strange to say, Grumpy Weasel was trying to be pleasant. Of course, he didn't really know how, or he always practiced being surly and rude. It must be confessed, too, that he had succeeded in making himself heartily disliked by everybody that knew him. There were a few, however, who had yet to learn of Grumpy Weasel's bad traits. Among these was a foolish fat hen who lived in Farmer Green's hen house, and now Grumpy Weasel was doing his best to make a good impression on her. It is no wonder, perhaps, that this lady was unaware of her caller's real nature, for Grumpy was careful, as a rule, to visit the farmyard only after dark, and being a person of quiet habits, Mrs. Hen was always abed and asleep at that time. Grumpy found it a bit difficult to chat with Mrs. Hen, because old dog Spot was sprawled on the farmhouse steps, and naturally Grumpy felt like keeping one eye on him. But the other he turned, as well as he could, on Mrs. Hen, who was in the hen-yard looking for worms. Just outside the wire fence, Grumpy Weasel crouched and told Mrs. Hen how well she was looking. His pretty speeches pleased Mrs. Hen so much that she actually let a fat angleworm get away from her because she hadn't her mind on what she was doing. She noticed, meanwhile, that one of her neighbors was making frantic motions, as if she had something important to say. So Mrs. Hen sauntered across the henyard to find out what it was. "'Don't you know whom you're talking to?' the neighbor demanded in a loud whisper. "'That's Grumpy Weasel, the worst rascal in all these parts!' Somehow that sent a pleasant flutter of excitement through Mrs. Hen. At the same time, she couldn't quite believe the news, because her caller had said such very pleasant things. "'Don't worry,' she told her neighbor. "'I'm old enough to look out for myself.' "'I should say so,' her neighbor cried. "'You're three years old if you're a day.' "'I'm not,' Mrs. Hen retorted. "'I'm only two and a half.' Her feathers were all ruffled up, and she went straight back and told Grumpy Weasel what her neighbor had said about him. "'You don't believe that, I hope,' Grumpy ventured. Mrs. Hen clucked and tried to look wise, and at last she confided to Grumpy that her neighbor was a jealous creature, and sure to speak ill of a stranger who came to call on anybody but herself. Well, Grumpy Weasel told Mrs. Hen that he knew, when he first set eyes on her, that she was a sensible little body. "'You've a snug home here,' he went on. I can tell you that I'd like such a place to crawl into on a chilly, wet night. And though it was a warm, fine summer's day, he shivered and shook so Mrs. Hen could see. And silly Mrs. Hen couldn't help feeling sorry for him. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of The Tale of Grumpy Weasel This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by john brandon the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey chapter fourteen grumpy vanishes grumpy weasel was quick to see that fat mrs hen swallowed every word he said as greedily as if he had been an angleworm yes you have a fine house here he said but of course you are crowded he added gloomily to show mrs hen that he knew she had no place for him oh not at all mrs hen assured him and the doors always shut tight at night he added on account of that prowling tommy fox yes we have to be careful said mrs hen and there's peter mink too grumpy went on don't leave an opening big enough for him he can get through a small hole too any that's big enough for his head at that mrs hen looked startled as if she had just remembered something that made her feel uneasy he couldn't get through a rat hole could he she inquired nervously why there isn't one here is there grumpy asked there is an old one she admitted it hasn't been used in my time if i could see it i'd know at once whether pete could crawl through it grumpy weasel said talking to himself or so it seemed to mrs hen i'll show it to you gladly she cried do come right in and look at our rat hole mr weasel as she spoke mrs hen started for the hen house and after her crept grumpy weasel hoping that nobody else would see him so far as he could tell the hens were all out of doors scratching in the dirt but suddenly mrs hen's jealous neighbor began to set up a great squawking calling upon mrs hen to be careful for she was in great danger fat mrs hen turned about with a vexed look upon her handsome but somewhat stupid face walk right in she said to grumpy i must stop and settle with her she has gone too far and leaving grumpy to find the rat hole without her help mrs hen fluttered across the hen yard with her head thrust forward to give her meddlesome neighbor a number of hard pecks and so teach her to mind her own affairs with a low chuckle grumpy weasel slipped inside the henhouse where he found himself quite alone it took him but a few moments to discover in one corner of the building the old rat hole of which mrs hen had spoken and he went to the door and looked out for mrs hen and her neighbor were making a terrific racket he saw the end of the squabble and soon mrs hen came running back with her feathers sadly rumpled and her comb awry i settled with her she gasped and now tell me about the rat hole could peter mink get through it no he couldn't grumpy weasel said then he dodged strangely back into the hen house and though mrs hen hopped in after him she couldn't find him anywhere she couldn't understand it end of chapter fourteen recording by john brandon chapter number fifteen of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey the great mystery the story soon spread all around the farmyard how fat mrs hen had been seen talking with no less a rascal than grumpy weasel everybody told her that it was a dangerous thing to do and that it was a wonder she had escaped 
until Mrs. Hen began to feel that she was quite the most important person in the neighborhood. Even old dog Spot asked her some questions one day, some of which she could answer, and some of which she could not. For one thing, she couldn't, or wouldn't, tell what way Grumpy left the farmyard. He just jumped back and was gone before I knew it, she said. That's what they all say, said Spot. He's so quick you never can see him go. Now, Mrs. Hen ought to have explained that Grumpy Weasel disappeared from inside the hen house, but she was not a person of much sense. By that time, she began to think that perhaps Grumpy Weasel was as bad as the neighbors had said and she was afraid that her relations might find fault with her if they learned that she had invited Grumpy to enter their house. Silly Mrs. Hen decided that she wouldn't tell what she had done, but she never tired of talking about what she called the great mystery, meaning, where did Grumpy Weasel go? It was simple enough. To escape meeting old dog Spot, Grumpy Weasel had crawled into the old rat hole. It suited him quite well to do that, for more than one reason. Not only did he avoid trouble, but he found the other end of the rat hole. Silly Mrs. Hen had done exactly as he had hoped. She had shown him a way to get into the hen house at night in spite of locks and bolts and doors and Grumpy Weasel went off to the woods well pleased with himself. Perhaps after all it pays to be pleasant, he said, just as if that was a reason. But he stopped short all at once. There's that stupid Mrs. Hen, he cried aloud. She was pleasant, but it won't pay her in the end. So he decided on the spot that he would keep on being surely. It would be much easier for him anyhow. That very night Grumpy Weasel stole back to the hen house, and he was just about to creep up to the old rat hole, pausing first to take a searching look all around, when he saw a motionless figure sitting on a low hanging limb of a tree nearby. It was Solomon Owl and Grumpy could see that he was staring at the rat hole as if he were waiting for somebody. Grumpy Weasel knew at once that that rat hole was no safe place for him. Very gingerly he drew back into a deep shadow, and as he pondered silently, he saw a huge rat step out of the hole. Solomon Owl swooped down and grabbed the fellow before he knew what was happening. Well, Grumpy Weasel saw that all his trouble had gone for nothing. Silly Mrs. Hen hadn't known what she was talking about. If Solomon Owl was in the habit of watching that hole, Grumpy certainly didn't mean to go near it. Of course he was angry, but Mrs. Hen never learned what he said about her no matter what remarks her neighbors made she always insisted afterward that grumpy weasel was one of the most pleasant and polite gentlemen she had ever met end of chapter 15「chapter 16 of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey. Chapter 16 Guarding the Corn Crib. Grumpy Weasel never seemed to have anything but bad luck whenever he went near the farmyard. Perhaps that was the reason why he kept going back there, for he was nothing if not determined. Anyhow, he had found the hunting poor along his stone wall in the woods, and there was so much game, as he called it, 
about the farm buildings that he thought it was silly to leave it for such scamps as peter mink and tommy fox and fatty coon so he took to loitering near farmer green's corn crib and he was not at all pleased to find fatty coon there one evening he wouldn't have spoken to fatty at all had not the plump young chap hurled a cutting remark directly at him there are no chickens in this building this is a corn crib don't you suppose i know that rumpy retorted i've come here to guard the corn from mice and squirrels there's no need of your doing that fatty coon told him have you never noticed those tin pans upside down on top of the posts on which the corn crib rests how could a mouse or a squirrel ever climb past one of those there are ways grumpy weasel said wisely i doubt it fatty replied i don't believe the trick can be done then not to oblige fatty but to show him he was mistaken grumpy climbed a tree nearby dropped from one of its branches to the roof of the corn crib and quickly found a crack in the side of the building through which he slipped with no trouble at all suddenly there was a great scurrying and scrambling inside and soon fatty coon saw frisky squirrel and several of his friends not to mention three frightened mice come tumbling out and tear off in every direction presently grumpy weasel stuck his head through a crack between two boards did you catch the robbers he called to fatty coon they were too spry for me fatty told him he wouldn't have stopped one anyway for grumpy weasel which way did they go old slowpoke grumpy cried as he jumped down in great haste everywhere fatty told him can't you be a little more exact you don't think do you that i can run more than one way at a time why don't you run around and round in a circle fatty suggested in that way you might catch at least half those youngsters and perhaps all of them that's the first real idea you've ever had in your life grumpy exclaimed which was as near to thanking a person as he was ever known to come end of chapter sixteen recording by john brandon chapter seventeen of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey chapter seventeen grumpy's mistake as soon as grumpy weasel left to chase the squirrels and mice that he had frightened away from the corn crib fatty coon hurried into the building through a hole in the floor which nobody knew but himself though he was a great eater fatty was also a fast one and now he bolted a huge meal of corn in only a few minutes then smiling broadly he left the corn crib by his private doorway and squatted down to await grumpy's return in a little while grumpy appeared i hoped i'd see you again fatty coon told him did you have any luck no grumpy weasel snapped i was mistaken about your idea it was a very poor one for i've been running in a circle as you suggested till i'm dizzy and i haven't seen the least sign of a mouse nor a squirrel fatty coon told him to cheer up i've another idea for you he said keep it keep it grumpy weasel hissed your last idea only made me tired and i haven't a capture to my credit tonight that's because you ran too fast fatty explained glibly now if you'll be careful to run slowly and do just as i tell you i can promise that there'll be a capture without fail 
grumpy had had such bad luck in his hunting about the farmyard that he decided to listen anyhow he told himself that he wouldn't take fatty's advice unless it was much better than he expected well go on he grunted do you see that little house near the woodshed fatty coon asked him it has a low doorway that's always open and no windows at all yes said grumpy weasel harshly oh yes i see it i'm not blind do you know who lives there i've always supposed that it belonged to johnny green said grumpy his father is big and lives in the big house and johnny is little and lives in the little house fatty coon laughed merrily you don't know as much as i thought you did he cried it may be that fatty had set out to make grumpy angry anyhow grumpy's eyes burned in the darkness like two coals of fire i'm right about that little house he wrangled nonsense fatty coon exclaimed and that made grumpy angrier than ever you learned that word of old mr crow he grumbled it's his favorite expression and i can't endure it you don't need to stay here and listen to it fatty coon said if you dared to you could run over to johnny green's house as you call it and if you found that you were right about it i promise you i'd never say nonsense again if grumpy weasel hadn't been so angry perhaps he wouldn't have been so eager to prove himself right while fatty watched him he bounded across the farmyard and stopped at the doorway of the tiny house and then he bounded back again a great deal faster with old dog spot yelping behind him fatty coon did not wait for anything more he made for the woods at top speed grinning as he went the next day he pretended to be surprised to meet grumpy you must have forgotten my advice he said i promised you there would be a capture if you ran slowly but it's plain that you ran too fast or you wouldn't be here nonsense grumpy weasel shouted flying into a passion at once and he often wondered afterward what fatty coon found to laugh at end of chapter seventeen recording by john brandon chapter eighteen of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey chapter eighteen pop goes the weasel there are many things that did not please grumpy weasel things that almost anyone else would have liked for instance there was music the pleasant valley singing society to which most of the bird people belonged did not number grumpy weasel among its admirers he never cared to hear a bird sing not even jolly robin's cousin the hermit who was one of the most beautiful singers in the woods and as for buddy brown thrasher whom most people thought a brilliant performer grumpy weasel always groaned whenever he heard him singing in the topmost branches of a tree a bird song according to grumpy weasel was of use in only one way it told you where the bird was and that was a help of course if you were trying to catch him nor did the musical frog family's nightly concerts have much charm for grumpy though he did admit that some of their songs were not so bad as others i can stand it now and then he said to hear a good glum croaking provided there are plenty of discords naturally knowing how he felt grumpy weasel's neighbors never invited him to listen to their concerts on the contrary they usually asked him please to go away if he happened to come along certainly nobody could sing his best with such a listener as a rule grumpy weasel was glad to go on about his business though to be sure he hated to oblige anybody but one day he stopped and scolded at the top of his voice when he came upon the woodchuck brothers whistling in the pasture 
their whistles quavered a bit when they noticed who was present and they moved a little nearer their front door in order to dodge out of sight if need be although grumpy weasel might follow them there was a back door they could rush out of and since they knew their way about their underground halls better than he did they did not worry greatly we're sorry said the biggest brother who was called billy woodchuck we're sorry you don't like our music and we'd like to know what's the matter with it for well, we always strive to please it's not so much the way you whistle grumpy snarled though your whistling is bad enough it's so cheerful what i find fault with especially is the tune it's insulting to me and you can't deny it well the woodchuck brothers looked at one another in a puzzled fashion never again let me hear you whistling pop goes the weasel grumpy warned them that was the name of the woodchuck brothers favorite air and the one they could whistle best and any one could see that they were quite upset why don't you like that tune billy woodchuck asked grumpy weasel politely it's the word pop grumpy said it reminds me of a pop gun and a pop gun reminds me of a real gun and that's something i don't want to think about well the woodchuck brothers looked at one another again but this time they smiled you've misunderstood billy woodchuck told grumpy weasel this is a different kind of pop it means that when you enter a hole you pop into it in a jiffy without taking all day to do it for a wonder grumpy weasel was always pleased that's true he cried i couldn't be slow if i wanted to be and he actually asked the woodchuck brothers to whistle pop goes the weasel once more but grumpy weasel never thought of thanking them end of chapter eighteen recording by john brandon chapter nineteen of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey chapter nineteen hiding from henry hawk in the spring grumpy weasel was always glad to see the birds coming back from the south but it must not be supposed that it was because he liked to hear them sing for he didn't nor should any one make the mistake of thinking that grumpy weasel loved the birds the only reason why he welcomed them was because he liked to hunt them and rob their nests but there were two birds that grumpy didn't care to have in pleasant valley he often wished that solomon owl and henry hawk would leave the neighborhood and never return that was because they liked to hunt him especially did grumpy weasel dislike henry hawk who had an unpleasant habit of sitting motionless on a limb in the top of some great tree from that high perch he swept the whole valley with his keen cruel eyes because as he said he liked to see what was going on if henry hawk saw anything anywhere that interested him he lost no time in reaching that place it might be a bird or a meadow mouse or maybe a plum chicken and he was always hoping to catch a glimpse of grumpy weasel one day early in the fall mr hawk saw what he had been looking for so long near the old cider mill up the road from farmer green's house he spied a long slender brownish shape moving swiftly among a pile of barrels outside the building he knew at once that it was grumpy weasel and though he was a long way off mr hawk could see that grumpy was very busy looking for something so busy mr hawk hoped that grumpy wouldn't notice anything else henry hawk had wonderful eyesight as he came hurtling down out of the sky he could see that grumpy was playing hide-and-seek with a mouse it's a shame to break up the game mr hawk chuckled to himself and just then something made grumpy weasel look up it must have been henry hawk's shadow flickering over a barrel there was no other sign that could have warned grumpy 
he put the meadow mouse out of his mind without a bit of trouble and made a sideways spring for the first hole on which his eyes lighted grumpy was through it in a twinkling henry hawk made a frantic grab with his talons at the black tip of grumpy's tail just as it whisked out of sight but he was too late it did not soothe henry hawk's feelings to find that the meadow mouse had vanished at the same time henry would have liked to play hide-and-seek with him himself mr hawk knew well enough where grumpy was hiding that slim fellow had sought safety in an empty jug which was lying on its side near the pile of barrels it made a fine fort for grumpy weasel the enemy couldn't break through it and there was only one loophole which was far too small to do henry hawk the least good henry saw at once that he might as well go away so he went off grumbling this he said is what comes of disorderly habits farmer green ought not to have left that jug lying there if he hadn't i might have been able to do him a good turn end of chapter nineteen recording by john brandon chapter twenty of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey chapter twenty a free ride inside the jug where he had hidden to escape henry hawk grumpy weasel yawned widely and licked his chops he was having a dull time waiting until he was sure that henry hawk had given up the chase and gone away in a little while grumpy believed he could venture out in safety but suddenly to his great disgust a wagon came clattering in from the road and pulled up right beside the pile of empty barrels near him it was farmer green driving his old horse ebenezer and of course grumpy weasel didn't care to show himself just then especially with old dog spot nosing around he had already heard spot give several sharp yelps that old dog knows i'm here somewhere but he can't tell exactly where grumpy said to himself he can yelp his head off for all i care and then spot began to whine and run in and out among the barrels until he all but tripped farmer green who was loading the barrels into the wagon let him whine said grumpy weasel softly his yelping and whining don't scare me he can't get inside this jug of mine and i certainly shan't leave it so long as he stays here meanwhile he could hear farmer green talking to old spot telling him not to be silly from the way you're acting anybody might think there was a bear around here he told spot old dog spot explained to farmer green in no uncertain fashion that it was no bear but a weasel that he was looking for his nose told him that and there was no mistake about it but somehow farmer green couldn't understand a word he said so after putting the last barrel on the load farmer green climbed up himself and started to drive off but old dog spot wouldn't budge an inch he hovered around the jug where grumpy weasel was hiding and made such a fuss that farmer green looked back at him well well he exclaimed and he stopped the horse ebenezer and jumped down and walked back again i declare i'd have forgotten to take this jug if you hadn't reminded me of it he told spot and thereupon he picked up the jug and set it in the back of the wagon this time spot followed this time he was in the wagon before farmer green was and all the way down the road until they reached the farmyard he acted or so farmer green told him like a simpleton 
the whole affair made grumpy weasel terribly angry he thought it was an outrage for farmer green to kidnap him like that and he was so enraged that he would have taken a bite out of anything handy but there wasn't a thing in the jug except himself at last the strange party drew up in front of the barn and stopped farmer green led ebenezer into his stall and then he took the jug with grumpy weasel still inside in and in spite of spot's protest set it high up on a shelf in the barn it was easy for grumpy after that to crawl out of the jug he scurried along the shelf climbed up the wall and glided through a crack in the ceiling to hide himself in the haymow above old spot didn't get me this time he said gleefully not by a jugful he didn't end of chapter twenty recording by john brandon chapter twenty one of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey a new suit throughout pleasant valley the very name of grumpy weasel was a bugaboo those of his size and many a good deal bigger than he learned early to avoid him one of the first things sandy chipmunk's mother did was to teach him to beware of grumpy and twice during his first summer sandy caught a glimpse of grumpy as he flashed past like a brown streak with a gleam of white showing underneath it was lucky for sandy that on both occasions grumpy was intent on chasing somebody or other and each time that sandy told his mother what he had seen mrs chipmunk said that she hoped it would never happen again i'm glad that you know what he looks like anyhow she added oh i'll know him if i see him sandy cried don't stop for a second look his mother warned him i won't he promised i won't even stop to say how do you do i should hope not mrs chipmunk said severely so sandy chipmunk went through his first summer on the watch for a long slender brownish shape but he never saw grumpy weasel again and winter found the chipmunk family all unharmed and very comfortable in their cosy house below frost line on mild days sandy liked to visit the world above and find a rock bare of snow where he could enjoy the sunshine it was on one of those outings that he caught sight of a stranger headed for the stone wall near by at first sandy missed seeing him against the snow but when he reached the wind-swept wall sandy couldn't help noticing him he was a slim gentle man and except for his black-tipped tail was dressed all in white after spending the winter underground sandy chipmunk was glad to talk with the first person he saw so he called to the stranger that it was a fine day wasn't it the other wheeled about so quickly that sandy couldn't help laughing don't be nervous sandy cried i won't hurt you but the stranger didn't answer once he opened his mouth and sandy chipmunk had a queer feeling then that he had met the fellow before that mouth had plenty of white needle-like teeth it had a cruel look too then the stranger jumped straight toward sandy chipmunk and in that instant sandy knew who he was no one could leap like that except grumpy weasel sandy turned and ran madly for shelter luckily he had the advantage of grumpy in one way he had a bare ledge to run on while grumpy weasel had to flounder for some distance through a snow-choked hollow so sandy escaped and it was lucky that grumpy didn't find the door to the chipmunk family's burrow if he had he would have gone right in himself mrs chipmunk blamed herself for sandy's adventure she had never remembered to tell her son that every fall grumpy weasel changed his summer dress for the one in which sandy had just seen him End of chapter twenty one
chapter twenty two of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey grumpy's threat meeting grumpy weasel in the woods one day tommy fox stopped to have a chat with him he always liked to chat with grumpy it was so easy to get him angry and such fun to see him fly into a passion you're looking very elegant in your winter suit tommy fox remarked white is becoming to you there's no doubt of that and that black tip on the end of your tail is just what's needed to complete your costume it matches your eyes nicely you must have a good tailor people were apt to be wary of tommy fox when fine words dripped from his mouth like that it usually meant that he was bent on some mischief and now grumpy weasel looked at him suspiciously if you admire my clothes so much why don't you get some like them he demanded tommy fox shook his head mournfully i'd like to he said but i'm too humble a person to dress like a king in ermine my family have always worn red the neighbors wouldn't know me in anything else or if they did they'd say i was putting on airs if you want to know what i think i'll tell you that red's entirely too good for you grumpy weasel sneered tommy fox smiled somewhat sourly grumpy weasel's remark did not please him but he managed to say nothing disagreeable i suppose he went on you've met the newcomer in our valley who dresses as you do in white and black what's that you say grumpy weasel barked who's gone and copied my cold weather clothes if i meet him i'll make it hot for him perhaps i shouldn't have mentioned the matter tommy fox said softly i don't like to displease you and i don't want to get a stranger into trouble either just as he has come to spend the winter amongst us and besides tommy added it would be a shame for you to quarrel with the stranger because he happens to choose your favorite colors that only goes to show that your tastes are alike that's exactly what i object to grumpy weasel complained getting much excited if his tastes are the same as mine he'll want to come and hunt along my stone wall and there'll be trouble if he does that the fur will fly tommy fox turned his head away for he simply had to enjoy a grin and he didn't want grumpy weasel to see it i'm sorry i spoke about the stranger he said glibly as soon as he could keep his face straight but i thought the news would please you it would certainly please me to meet him grumpy weasel declared fiercely and it would please me much more than it would him i can tell you it wouldn't be treating a newcomer well to let him wander through the woods when you feel as you do about him i ought to warn him to leave pleasant valley before it's too late tommy said it would be treating him better to give him a good lesson before he goes grumpy weasel said you needn't say a word to him about my wanting to meet him let the fur fly first and then he'll flee that's my way of getting rid of strangers End of chapter 22。Chapter 23 of the Tale of Grumpy Weasel。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey. A Bold Stranger tommy fox had carefully kept from grumpy weasel the name of the stranger who was dressed like grumpy in white and black it happened that he wore feathers this newcomer and that was one reason why tommy fox had had to grin when grumpy threatened to make the fur fly when he met the unknown another reason why tommy had laughed at grumpy's blustering was that the stranger was quite able to take care of himself in a fight he belonged to the snowy owl family being bigger even than solomon owl and what with his hooked beak and his strong talons he was a dangerous fellow to meet although grumpy weasel could easily handle a rabbit or a wild duck a dozen times his own size 
because they were unarmed he would have had no chance at all with mr snowy owl all this made tommy fox chuckle and grin as he left grumpy and loped off towards cedar swamp where mr snowy owl was spending the winter unlike solomon owl and his cousin simon screecher mr snowy owl did not turn night into day so tommy fox found him wide awake and ready for a fight or a frolic whichever might come his way he was a handsome bird this newcomer in his showy white suit spotted with black and he gave tommy fox a bold hard look acting for all the world as if he had spent his whole life in pleasant valley instead of merely two short weeks now mr snowy owl knew a good deal about such rascals as tommy fox so he said at once what's on your mind young man you've come here on mischief and you needn't deny it well tommy fox saw that he couldn't deceive mr owl very much so he grinned at him and told him about the talk he had just had with grumpy weasel he's so eager to meet you it would be too bad to disappoint him tommy observed he wants the fur to fly you know although he had no ears at least so far as could be seen mr snowy owl had listened closely to tommy fox's story and he must have heard plainly enough for he said quickly that he would call on grumpy weasel that very day i'll start right now he said and i'll reach grumpy weasel's hunting ground before you're out of the swamp i wish you'd wait a bit till i can get there myself tommy fox told him mr snowy owl agreed to that and after lingering until he thought tommy must have had time to run and find grumpy weasel he rose above the tops of the cedars and sailed off to join them himself i'm glad i came here to spend the winter he muttered everybody's been very pleasant so far and after people hear how i've settled with this weasel person the folks in pleasant valley will be pretty polite to me or i'll know the reason why end of chapter twenty three chapter twenty four of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey fur and feathers to find grumpy weasel tommy fox went straight back to the place where he had left him it was easy then to follow his queer tracks grumpy's legs were so short that they did not lift his lean body clear of the deep snow except when he jumped very high so his trail looked somewhat like that of a snake with legs as soon as tommy overtook him he asked grumpy if he had seen the stranger yet who was dressed all in white and black like him no i haven't but i'm on the lookout for him all the time said grumpy where are you looking tommy inquired oh everywhere grumpy replied behind the trees and in the bushes and back of the stone wall have you seen any new tracks tommy persisted not one grumpy admitted and then he thought he caught the flicker of a smile on tommy fox's narrow face if there is no such person if you've been deceiving me he began angrily i promise you that there is such a stranger in the neighborhood tommy cried and if you don't meet him to-day i'll be as disappointed as you it seems to me grumpy weasel snapped you're altogether too anxious over this business everybody knows you're tricky and i begin to think you're trying to get me into trouble it was wonderful the way tommy fox could keep his temper no matter what people said to him he could still smile if it would help him to have his way and now he kept up a never-ending chatter without saying anything in particular the snow was deep enough to have covered such hiding places as grumpy weasel liked the stone wall indeed offered about the only crannies and that was some distance away tommy fox had noticed that and that was why he was trying to keep grumpy weasel where he was for tommy expected mr snowy owl at any moment 
you are talking foolishness grumpy told tommy fox at last i don't care to waste my time listening to you and he turned away one moment please tommy begged for the sly rascal had just caught a glimpse of mr snowy owl hovering above the trees what do you want now grumpy weasel scolded as he paused close by the old hemlock where solomon owl sometimes sat and abused him i want to see the fur fly tommy fox answered wickedly for a moment grumpy weasel couldn't think what he meant but suddenly he saw a large whitish shape dropping upon him out of the sky he knew then in a flash that tommy fox had deceived him a moment more and it was all over at least it seemed so to tommy fox whatever had happened had taken place so quickly that he couldn't see it clearly but there was mr snowy owl sitting on a limb of the hemlock where he had perched after staying half a second's time on the ground and grumpy weasel was no longer to be seen anywhere did did you swallow him tommy fox stammered mr snowy owl looked puzzled i don't know he replied perhaps i did if i didn't i don't know where he is tommy fox couldn't help looking disappointed i'm sorry about one thing he said it was all done so quickly i didn't see the fur fly then there was a faint sound above them and looking up tommy and mr owl saw grumpy weasel's head sticking out of a small hole high up in the tree trunk as they watched him grumpy weasel seemed to be saying something to them they couldn't hear what it was but no doubt it was nothing pleasant end of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox org. the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey peter mink's promise it happened on a bleak winter's day that grumpy weasel was strolling along the bank of broad brook when all at once he heard a squall instantly he whirled around there was something about the cry that sounded familiar and while he searched the stream up and down with his sharp eyes he grew angrier every moment unless i'm mistaken that's my good-for-nothing cousin peter mink grumpy muttered i'll teach him not to squall at me the rascal he did not have to look long before he caught sight of his cousin peter mink was crouched under the overhanging bank not far from the edge of the frozen surface of the brook and he squalled again when he saw that grumpy had discovered him stop that grumpy weasel bellowed he was not greatly afraid of peter mink though his cousin was much bigger than he i'll have you know that i don't allow people to bawl at me even if we are distantly related i wasn't bawling at you peter mink answered and he was strangely polite for him i was calling for help can't you see that my foot is caught in a trap at that grumpy jumped down upon the ice and took a good look at peter mink he saw then that peter spoke the truth this trap hurts my foot i can tell you peter mink whined maybe it will teach you not to screech at people grumpy told him you're going to help me aren't you peter mink asked his cousin anxiously that trap belongs to farmer green's hired man grumpy informed peter mink i saw him when he set it there perhaps you would like to have me send word to him that you're using it oh don't do that peter begged piteously well then suppose i get old dog spot to come and see what he can do he'd have you out of that trap in no time but that suggestion didn't suit peter mink any better for goodness sake can't you think of something else he wailed his voice rose higher and higher as he spoke and grumpy weasel showed his sharp teeth as he warned peter mink again not to squall at him for he wouldn't stand it at last peter saw that grumpy did not intend to help him at all so it occurred to him that perhaps he could hire his cousin to free him from the trap i'd do anything for you if you could help me out of this fix he said finally 
will you drive mr snowy owl away from pleasant valley grumpy cried certainly said peter with great promptness as if that were the easiest matter in the world that answer surprised grumpy weasel he had no idea that peter mink could do any such thing and he said as much too you understand peter explained it may take me some time to get rid of him it's midwinter now but i promise you that i'll have him out of the valley by april fool's day end of chapter twenty five chapter number twenty six of the tale of grumpy weasel this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c the tale of grumpy weasel by arthur scott bailey how grumpy helped grumpy weasel wondered how peter mink was going to get mr snowy owl out of pleasant valley he had never dreamed that peter could do it but as he thought the matter over he remembered that peter was a good deal bigger than himself if i were peter mink's size i would give mr snowy owl the worst punishing he ever had grumpy exclaimed under his breath so maybe peter can do as he claims after all very well grumpy weasel told peter mink this is a bargain i'll help you out of the trap and you'll rid pleasant valley of mr snowy owl by april fool's day agreed peter mink cried and now how are you going to set me free i'm going to bite your leg off grumpy weasel said cheerfully oh no you're not going to do that peter mink howled i don't want you to do that i made a bargain with you grumpy weasel reminded him and i intend to carry out my part of it stop a moment peter mink cried for grumpy weasel with his back arched like a cat's and his white whiskers twitching had already taken a step towards him if you bite off my leg i'll never be able to get rid of mr snowy owl that brought grumpy weasel up short he thought deeply for a moment and then he exclaimed i have it you must bite off your own leg but peter mink proved a hard one to please you don't understand he said if i lose a leg i know i never could get mr snowy owl out of the valley at that grumpy weasel lost his temper completely with a cry of rage he sprang at his cousin peter mink prisoner though he was and grumpy would have buried his white teeth in him except for just one thing as he leaped forward peter mink leaped backwards and in that moment peter freed himself he had been caught only by the merest tip of a toe anyhow and now he crouched with his back against the bank of the brook facing grumpy weasel with mouth wide open his meekness had dropped off him like an old coat and grumpy weasel knew better than to get within his reach in fact he turned polite himself all at once there he said i got you out of the trap as i planned to all the time i knew that if i could make you jump you'd pull your foot loose well peter mink hardly believed that but he thought there was no use of saying so he was glad enough to escape farmer green's hired man's trap without having a dispute over the way it happened i hope you'll keep your promise grumpy told peter mink if mr snowy owl doesn't leave these parts by april fool's day 
I won't like it very well. You know you agreed to get him away from here by that time. Oh, he'll be gone by then, said Peter Mink lightly. He always leaves at the end of the winter, because he spends his summers in the far north. When he heard that, Grumpy Weasel was angry as anything. Then Mr. Owl is likely to be back here next fall, he said quickly. I dare say, Peter Mink admitted carelessly. Grumpy Weasel backed cautiously away before he said another word. But when he had whisked into a great willow that leaned over Broad Brook, he told his cousin what he thought about him. As for Peter Mink, he was nursing his injured paw in his mouth, and he said never a word. The End End of chapter 26 End of the Tale of Grumpy Weasel by Arthur Scott Bailey